So chapter five and chapter six uh, really are around the issue of inventory and how inventory works. Chapter five introduces you to that by looking at merchandising businesses, which are businesses that buy inventory and sell it to us. They buy it from other businesses and they resell it to us. And everyone here has dealt with that. So any type of a retail store you walk into is a merchandising operation. Okay, um, and so that's that's not an issue. And then, of course, because it's a retail store, they actually have a different setup for their income statement. And uh, we're going to be looking at that in chapter five because inventory sort of changes the equation. Inventory starts as an asset. It's a current asset, if you might remember from your classified balance sheet days. Uh, and then once it's sold, it actually becomes an expense. And so that's going to be looked at. It's a different structure to the income statement, but one that's easy to, to catch on to. All right, so we're going to be looking at uh, merchandising operations um, today. And hopefully we'll get into um, the, the purchase and sale of inventory from business to business. Okay, so before, you know, Walmart puts all of their, you know, uh, laundry baskets out and they're going to be, you know, for you to buy a laundry basket if you need one, uh, they had to buy it from Rubbermaid or some other company that makes, you know, those laundry baskets and put it on the shelf. And so uh, the purchase uh, and sale of uh, that happens between the business, business to business. So Walmart is buying the laundry baskets um, from say Rubbermaid company and Rubbermaid is selling the baskets to Walmart. So learning objective two and three look at basically um, how each business looks at the transaction. Okay, it's the same transaction. One business is selling stuff to another business. One's the buyer, one's the seller. Um, how does the buyer keep their books? How does the seller keep their books from the same transaction? Okay. Uh, then we're going to look at multi step the income statements, looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, one of the most important things to understand is in a retail store, uh, inventory is an asset. But once you sell it, it's an expense. And so there's a new expense account. You were introduced to it very briefly uh, from chapters one and uh, I think chapter one and maybe chapter two. But cost of goods sold is actually an expense account um, that shows up on the income statements of merchandising companies. And then we're going to do some analysis Woo -hoo -hoo! to wrap this up. OK, so how exciting is that? I don't know if you can tell me. Again, you've all been to uh, a merchandiser, okay? Uh, merchandisers in the business of buying and selling goods, okay? And so that's super important. So you've, you've probably dealt with Walmart, you've dealt with Amazon. Uh, the book introduces you to REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated. It's like a, uh, like a Dick's Sporting Goods uh, type of store. I don't know if you've seen one, but it's a, it's a retailer. And so basically speaking, the, the entire purpose of a merchandising company is simply buying and selling goods. The only reason Walmart exists is to sell goods to you. That's it. There's no other, I mean, it doesn't serve any other purpose. Same thing for Target, same thing for Kohl's, same thing for Office Depot and Staples, same thing for any other retail store. The whole purpose of the store is to buy goods and buy goods so they can sell it to you. That's it. That's it. So because of that, inventory is a very important asset. You kind of know how important inventory is. Look what's happening in New York City uh, this weekend and, and getting ready. They're, they're hoping that they don't see riots uh, in, in the streets, but they're boarding up their, you know, Macy's and other stores are boarding up their windows and, and locking their doors because they don't want the inventory to be stolen. Why? Because that inventory is what they sell. That's what they make a profit on. So they certainly don't want it to be stolen. So they're taking all different types of measures to protect it, including boarding up their windows and doors 
um, in case, you know, something bad happens. So, you know, this is important. The whole existence of a merchandising or a retailer is selling goods. They buy them first, then they sell them to you. I don't know why they call them retail. It really should be resale, in my opinion. Um, Walmart has changed everything. It used to be a traditional uh, setup was, you know, a wholesaler would sell the goods to a retailer who then would sell the goods to the consumer. What's missing here is the wholesaler would get it from the manufacturer, okay, from the manufacturer. Um, this has changed. Walmart basically changed the system going back now 30 plus years. Uh, Walmart basically doesn't deal with wholesalers uh, and wholesalers are, are becoming more and more scarce. Uh, they deal directly with the manufacturer and they buy directly from the manufacturer to put it in their store. And then, um, and then they sell it to you as a customer. Okay. So you, when you and I go in uh, to a retail store, um, we see prices on, you know, on the, on the merchandise, whether we're looking at a sweater or a backpack or whatever, the prices that you and I pay uh, is the sales revenue for the company, for the retailer. It's a direct relationship. You walk into Walmart and you buy, a, you know, a $20, $20 with a laundry stuff. I don't know why I'm hooked on laundry this morning. I just feel like clean. Um, you know, $20 down, uh, that's, their, that's their sales revenue. Um, well, what did they get for that 20? They sold you a product, right? They sold you a product. Uh, that, that laundry detergent or other types of thing is the good that they're selling. Well, you got to understand that the retailer must buy the goods first. So they buy it from the manufacturer, or in some cases, some smaller stores might still be dealing with wholesalers. Um, so there's actually a cost to the retailer to buy it. So obviously they wanna sell it to you at as high a price above their cost as possible. Well, that's, so that's, that's merchandising in a nutshell. They have costs like any other business, but believe it or not, the biggest cost they have is buying the goods to sell to you, okay? They still have to pay employees, they still have to pay rent, they still have to pay utilities, they still have a whole bunch of other expenses, but the biggest expense they've got really, once it comes down to it, and you'll see, it's actually buying the goods and selling it to you. That's the biggest thing. Um, so this is what this chapter introduces you to. Let's take a peek. So again, um, how, how a merchandising company's income statement is different than what you've seen so far. What you've seen so far is revenue minus expenses equals net income. Um, in a, in a merchandising company, the revenue account you'll see is called sales revenue because the word sales is related to a good. So any merch, any company that sells goods will have sales revenue, the sale of a good that's different than going to your dentist that'll have service revenue because they're performing a service for you. So this is another type of revenue account, another title to a revenue account um, that's important to distinguish. Sales are very are specific to goods, selling a good, a product, where uh, a service revenue is specific for work that you've paid someone to do. But look what they do in a merchandiser. As soon as they collect the sales revenue, the very, very first thing they do is subtract out what's called cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is an expense account and it represents, like I was telling you, they have to buy, before they can sell it to you, they gotta buy the good first. They buy the inventory, put it on the shelf. The only purpose of buying that is to sell it to you. They don't want it. They don't want it on the shelf very long. The whole purpose of it is to move it to you because that's where they make, this is how they're making their profit. This is how they make a living, selling goods. So as soon as they sell the good to you, the first thing they do is subtract out what it costs them. 
to buy that good, to buy that product. And that's cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is an expense account. Right? It's an expense account. That gives them something called a gross profit. The gross profit is simply the difference between the sales revenue, which again, you and I pay in the prices that, you, that we agree to pay in the store for a product. So it's the sales revenue minus the cost of goods sold equals the gross profit, okay? Um, and that's all gross profit is. The difference between what you paid for the product at the, at the store minus what they paid for the product to put it on the shelf to sell it to you. That's it, that's all it is. From the gross profit, all the other expenses, all the other expenses are taken away and thus they have net income. Right. Uh, and as a lot of other companies are experiencing net losses, net losses because if you're not selling any of your products, then you're not, you know, you're not making a gross profit. You're not making a profit at all. Remember, the profit comes from the revenue in all companies. Okay. The profit comes from the, the from the revenue. So if businesses have to close for whatever reason, they can't sell anything. Thus, if they're not selling anything, uh, well, guess what? They still have to pay their rent. They still have to pay certain bills. So they're not selling anything, but they got expenses. Uh, that's simply going to take away from the profit and they're going to result in a loss. That can only happen for so long uh, for certain businesses before they close. Before they close. So you have seen a lot of companies, um, well, larger companies have declared bankruptcy. <clears throat> um, some companies have, have totally closed or shuttered their doors. And this is, this is the income statement that they're looking at here. If you're not selling anything, you still got a bunch of costs. That doesn't go away. Some costs don't go. Even if you lay off all your staff, you're still going to pay rent on, on the store. You're still going to pay utilities. You're still going to pay certain things. You're going to pay your taxes. Um, so, you know, there's all different types of things that, that happen and, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy all the time. It's, uh, uh, merchandising or retail is one of the most, I think it's one of the more difficult businesses to get into because of all of the expenses they have. This is an expense, cost of goods sold is an expense in addition to all the other expenses. Um, that, that makes it difficult, makes it difficult. Um, a lot of people say, well, labor is, uh, well, labor is part of their operating expenses. So the costs of labor, both salary and benefits are here. Believe it or not, the cost of goods sold is bigger in all merchandisers than the cost of labor plus, okay? So uh, it is something that's super important. And of course, if any of you've worked retail, you know most of them are minimum wage jobs. Uh, that's because that's they, they really can't afford to pay you anymore because the, uh, the biggest expense they have is in the cost of buying and selling the goods to customers. Okay. Um, they talk a little bit about operating cycles here. Um, you know, obviously a service company performs the services, they might have an accounts receivable and they receive the cash for that. Okay, that's yeah, it's very simplistic. Um, merchandising companies have a little bit more. They actually have to buy the inventory first. Right, like I was telling you, they have to buy the inventory first, have it delivered to them. That is, this is their asset. Okay. Then they have to sell the inventory. Sometimes they sell the inventory on account, which means they're waiting to receive payment on inventory that they've sold. And thus, once they get the cash, it goes back and they use that cash to buy more inventory, blah, 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 blah. So it just becomes a circle in this case, or as they say, not a, if not a circle, a cycle. And I don't know how many of you have worked retail. Um, has anyone worked in retail? Does anyone work in retail? I do. Okay. 
view of your head. Okay, so you, you know this already though. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how this works is there's sort of a flow to the costs regarding uh, about inventory. At the end, at the beginning of every uh, period of time, and let's say they use uh, a fiscal year, say February 1st uh, of every year through January 31st of the following year as their 12 month fiscal period. Uh, they are going to start with certain amount of inventory already in the store. Now they usually have a low beginning inventory because usually after uh, the Christmas season, they don't have a lot of inventory left because the Christmas season is when they move the most inventory, when they sell the most inventory. So you have whatever's beginning in the store is beginning inventory. Remember, inventory is an asset account. Okay. Uh, then they go ahead and they buy a whole bunch of inventory. They're gonna restock those shelves. Matter of fact, they're always restocking shelves. <clears throat> so there's, they're always making purchases of new inventory to put on the shelf. Okay. Because they never, you never want to walk into a store and see empty shelves. You're going to walk right back out, right? Um, so they're always restocking the shelves, one of the most important things they can do. And in order to restock the shelves, they're going to purchase the inventory first. So now between their beginning inventory and all the purchases, that's all the money they've spent on inventory that's available for sale. Okay. Now the good news is only two things can happen to inventory from an accounting perspective. Okay. Uh, either you still own it. So at the end of a period, say at the end of a month, the end of a quarter, end of a year, you still own it. Well, it's your asset, it's your asset. Uh, inventory is an asset account. Okay. And here I go trying, uh, trying to write with my finger here. Inventory is an asset account. We don't use the word ending or begin. We just, we do for this chart to show the flow, but inventory on the uh, balance sheet is listed as inventory. The ending inventory simply means the inventory at the end of the month or at the end of the year, for example, that's ending inventory. Well, if you started off with all this inventory and you bought more, um, you know, you say you have $10,000 of inventory in the store, uh, for sale, all that's what you started with, plus all the ones you bought, 10,000, you only got a thousand left in the store. Well, we're assuming you sold the rest. So the rest of the, uh, whatever is not in the store at the end of the period is going to be cost of goods sold, which as I mentioned to you is an expense account, cost of goods sold is an expense account. Okay, uh, that should be an E, although it's kind of an odd shape, sorry. So this is sort of the flow, stuff already in the store, they buy a whole lot more, that's all the money they spent on inventory. What's left is still theirs, it's an asset. What's not there has been sold, cost of goods sold is an expense. Companies use, uh, well, most companies use a per, what's called a perpetual inventory system. They continually track uh, inventory. And you know that because if you're a work retail, when inventory comes in the store, the first thing you're doing is scanning it in, right? Well, anytime a company buys inventory, they're scanning it in because they want to add it to the total. They want to add it to the total here. So um, they know exactly what's in inventory at any given time because the computer system allows them to track it continuously. So perpetual is sort of a continual, continuously updated, updated inventory system. So you know there's only, you know, four packages of, of vanilla ice cream, uh, you know, left in, in the store. Um, so, you know, you probably need to order more, you know, and so this allows them to do their purchasing properly. Um, but there are a lot of smaller shops or specialty shops that don't have, and of course the perpetual system is computerized. 
that's what all the barcodes are on there for is it's very easy to scan things in, scan things out. Um, and that barcode allows the computer to continually update things. Well, what if you work at a, at a place, a very small place that doesn't have a computerized inventory system? Well, they're using something called a periodic inventory system, which means periodically, say every month, every whatever, they, they basically count the, the, uh, the inventory in the store, what's left. Whatever's left, they know how they, know they have to manually update the records and then they count what's left. Whatever's not there, they, the expense is cost of goods sold. Um, even a company, but even if a company uses a perpetual inventory system, they will still do a count usually at the end of the year. They usually will do a uh, what's called a physical inventory. They'll literally print out sheets of paper saying that the computer says we have, you know, four bottles of children's chewable aspirin on the shelf. You know, say you work for CVS, CVS brand. And you, you know, then you have to physically count it and you're counting one, two, three. Hang on, there's one, two, I only, I, there's only three physical bottles that I count. The computer system says I have four. Well, the one that's not there, is simply going to be expensed. Okay, um, we, it doesn't matter why it's not there. Like, oh, maybe it was stolen. Well, okay, it doesn't really matter if it was stolen or or taken or whatnot. From an accounting perspective, if the inventory is not in the store when we do our count, it's going to be expensed. It's going to be expensed. It's cost of goods sold. So that's sort of an important measure to sort of understand here for inventory. Okay. Um, okay. So I've already explained the perpetual system and the periodic system. Uh, without further delay, let's get to our do it exercise here. So uh, this asks you whether, you know, these statements are true or false. Um, and of course, they got to kind of give you the answer anyway here. So the primary source of revenue for a merchandising company is performing services. No, it's selling, it's selling goods, all right? The, the revenue stream for merchandisers is selling goods, okay? Uh, that's why it's false. Which would be sales revenue. The operating cycle of a service company is usually shorter and simpler than that of a merchandising company. That's true, that's very true. Uh, sales revenue less the cost of goods sold equals gross profit. This is something you definitely need to know. It's true, but that's something you will need to know. Okay. Uh, it's a relatively easy thing to remember uh, once you look at it a few times, but that's something that you definitely need to know. And then it says here the end in inventory plus the cost of good purchase equals the goods available for sale. No, it's actually the beginning inventory plus all the stuff, all the goods we purchased. That equals everything available for sale, just the opposite. So that's why it's false here. All right, take a quick break, come back to our main screen. And that was sort of the introduction to uh, merchandising and inventory. Again, I can't express enough that you've already experienced this and some of you are already in retail, you understand how, how that works. But again, those retail stores don't make anything. They just sell. Even if they have their own brands, they're not making them. They hire a manufacturer to make them. They bring, they have to buy them. They put them in the store. That's their inventory. That costs them money. They keep track of the cost of inventory. And then they sell it to you as a customer. You pay a certain price. That's their sales revenue. That sales revenue is subtracted from what it costs them to bring that good to you, cost of goods sold. That gives you a gross profit. So that those are like really critical things to sort of understand in this part of the chapter. Any questions on that? Now you're all shaking your head like, no. Pretty clear, Rujo, keep moving. 
So I will. Uh, all right. So the next, uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to show you an invoice um, in, in part two, learning objective two of this chapter, uh, looks at that invoice from the buyer's perspective. When you buy merchandise from another company, how does it look to you? How do you keep your accounting records if you're the buyer? Learning objective three looks at the same transaction, but from the seller, you just sold goods to this other company. How do you keep the records as a seller? Okay, we good on that? And then we'll wrap up today. That's kind of what I wanted to make sure we got through today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Please pay attention. Mm -hmm. Drugs are bad. Retail is bad. No. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> here we go. Here's an invoice. Woohoo! This is an important document because it really tells us everything we really need to know. Um, first of all, can anyone tell me who this, uh, who the buyer and seller are? Who's the buyer and who's the seller in this invoice? You had your coffee this morning? Mm -hmm. It's hard to read the name, but... Uh, oh, it, don't make any excuses, you're young. <laughs> James Hover. <laughs> yes, uh, it's rude. Is that, is that the buyer or the seller? That's the buyer. That's the buyer. Good, good. All right. Thank you very much. And the seller is Audio Supplies Inc. Right, right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Excellent job. So uh, again, this is going to be this is a business to business transaction. What we uh, often deem as B two B business to business transaction. Uh, and as Gio was saying, is absolutely right. We have the buyer here is this company Sock Stereo. Okay. Um, the company is the buyer, although it's going to go to the purchasing agent at that company. Um, but Sock Stereo is the buyer. Okay. And you can know that because it's sold too. So if you're selling it to this person or this company, that person that, or that company is the buyer. Um, whoever has the invoice printed is going to put their stuff on it. So they're the seller. They're the seller. Um, there's only two ways for uh pw audio supply to sell sock stereo what they sold them which is a printed circuit board how exciting and some circuits how exciting uh they're either going to collect the cash when they uh when they sell it to them or they're going to say pay me later in which case this invoice becomes an accounts receivable to PW Audio, but Sock Stereo has to pay it. So it becomes an accounts payable to Sock Stereo. Again, same invoice, but the buyer and the seller look at it differently. Okay. Um, so the invoice that Sock Stereo looks at it's a purchase invoice. They're looking at this is uh, this is a purchase that we made. So we have this one new printed circuit board here, and then we have these five different circuits. The number is one circuit board, five circuits. Okay, uh, that's important. And I need you to squint a little bit more if you could, uh, because there's several other pieces of information that are important on this invoice. One is the date. One is the date. And I'm going to have to actually squint myself. That says May the 4th, May the 4th of uh, 2017. Um, and so here on May the 4th of 2017, Sock Stereo purchased this inventory. That's how they're seeing it. PW Audio is seeing this as a sale. Same date. 
different company who's buying it looks at it one way, the company who's selling it looks at it another way. Uh, there are a couple of other interesting things about this, the terms and something called FOB. So let's look at the terms first. Uh, the terms are the payment terms for what's owed. Okay, what's payment terms uh, for what's owed. And so um, in this case, they bought a, uh, a circuit board and five uh, circuits and it's $3,800, thank you very much. Okay, well, Sox Stereo has, the follow, has been given the following terms of payment by PW Audio. If they pay within 10 days, they can take 2% discount. If they don't pay within 10 days, the net amount, that's the full amount, is due in 30 days. 30 days from the invoice date. So if they pay within 10 days, which is by the 14th, they can actually pay 2% less because that's the terms that they've been given. But if they pay after the 14th, then they pay the whole thing in full. Another uh, very important little piece here is when does the ownership take place? Remember, PW Audio Supply owns the circuit board and circuits. They are selling them to Sox Stereo. So when does this become Sox Stereo's property? Right, and no longer PW Audio's property. It's like when if you sold a car to uh, a neighbor, well, the car's in your name and the neighbor wants to buy it. Well, at what point does the neighbor have ownership of the car, right? And you no longer own the car. Well, that's that, that process is what's provided here. Um, FOB shipping point simply means that at the point in time, uh, PW Audio gives this box of goods to the shipping company, then Sox Stereo owns it. That's the point in which the ownership transfer transferred. Well, that's good. That's big because you know PW Audio is in Michigan, uh, Sox Stereo is in Illinois, so they're going to have to use, you know. Any of the uh, shipping companies, they certainly could use the postal service, um, you know, but they could also use, you know, a traditional delivery service, a UPS, a DHL, you know, FedEx, et cetera, uh, or a specialty company, you know, who knows. But that's a long way for this thing to travel. So Stock, Stock Stereo actually owns it when it leaves the, uh, when it leaves this company's office in Michigan. They own it all the way through till it gets to them in Illinois. So these are very important uh, points as well to understand that an invoice has to be read to get an understanding of what's happening. It also is read, the same invoice is looked at differently between the buyer and the seller. Learning objective two looks at this from the buyer's perspective. So we're gonna be looking at Sox Stereo's perspective of this in Learning Objective 2. Learning Objective 3 looks at the exact same transaction, but from the seller perspective, PW Audio. So Learning Objective 3 will look at the exact same information, but how PW Audio would record it. All right, so on May the 4th, Sox Stereo bought $3,500 no, sorry, $3,800 worth of, um, you know, but the circuit board and the circuits. So on May the 4th, that becomes their inventory. They're going to show that on May the 4th, they bought $3,800 inventory. Remember, inventory is an asset account. Assets are going to increase on the debit side. So as soon as they bought the inventory, they had more, as soon as they bought this, they had more inventory. When do they have more inventory? Right on May 4th when they bought it. That's the importance of the date. And of course, this is an invoice that has terms. If it's got terms, that means it's owed. <laughs> it 
If it just if it just says paid in full, there's no, there'll be no current, there'll be no terms. The terms are for payment. So that's why they have to credit accounts payable to show they actually have now they have another bill to pay. Well, uh, there's always going to be some degree of costs for shipping. We call it freight. Okay, freight is just basically shipping. And like I said, there are two uh, ways of looking at it. What's very common is FOB shipping point, which means that as soon as the seller puts it in a box and gives it to the transportation company, it is no longer the seller's uh, inventory. It's now been transferred to the buyer. The buyer now owns the inventory, okay? Which is why Sox Stereo can make that entry right away into their inventory because literally they're going to own it that day. It's going to ship that day. So they got it. When this happens, the inventory belongs to the buyer. So the buyer is going to pay the freight. They're going to pay for the shipping. They're going to pay for the insurance. Um, because if anything happens to the inventory, you know, the truck might, that it's on might you know, it might be a snowstorm and, and fall off the road and go down into a you know ravine or something terrible. Um, well, it's your inventory, so you have to you have to go ahead and um, and make sure that's insured. The other option is something called FOB destination. Well, that means that the seller not only boxes it up, but the seller then puts it on a truck or some carrier and that carrier goes all the way to where the buyer lives or where the buyer's company is and delivers the box of goods. So once it reaches its destination, that's when the ownership gets to the buyer, which means the seller owns it all this way. And if the seller owns the merchandise all this way, they're gonna be paying for the freight and they are also gonna be paying for the insurance on that just in case something terrible happens to the delivery truck. Okay, so that's basically when ownership changes hands. So again, at shipping point, the buyer is gonna pay for the shipping. FOD, FOB destination, the seller is gonna pay for the shipping. Okay, if the seller pays for the shipping, it simply goes down as sort of like a freight expense. It's, not, it's, it's an expense. Freight is an expense to a seller. That's not true for the buyer. And you'll see that in a moment. So let's assume that upon delivery, uh, Sox Stereo pays the freight company 150 bucks, 150 bucks. What's the entry that goes on the stair, on Sox Stereo? Remember, they're the buyer. Well, we have to go back to chapter two when they introduced you to GAP. And one of those very interesting principles is something called the historical cost principle. And that means we actually have to list the assets at what they really cost. So if you bought inventory for a price and then you had to pay to ship the inventory, technically the way we look at it is your inventory costs more. Okay. What did you pay for it? Well, I paid $5. Well, didn't you pay a dollar for shipping? Yeah, so you really paid six bucks. So in accounting, we look at the freight costs for the buyer just simply to be part of the cost of the inventory. And so in this case, inventory would get an additional $150 debit to show that it actually costs more. Okay, actually is more. And of course, if we paid cash, we simply would credit cash here. Again, if PW Audio, who is the seller, it, you know, paid for the freight charges, well then PW Audio would actually simply write it down as an expense. The expense account, freight, freight out, um, what have you, that's an expense. Okay. 
Well, you probably have gotten stuff in the mail and you've opened up the boxes and you've looked through the merchandise and you might be dissatisfied with something. Maybe you think it's an inferior quality. Maybe it didn't meet your uh, specifications. Maybe they're damaged or defective. You don't know. So what do you do? Well, you return it, <laughs> right? You, you, you send it back. Um, this, is, this is pretty common. Some people who, you know, say it's an inferior quality, they might call back and say, look, I'm gonna return this unless you give me uh, a lower price. Reduce my price and I'll keep it. Otherwise it's gonna go back to you. Most people don't do that. Most people like, I don't like this, I'm sending it back. And so returns are quite common for, for, the, for the purchaser. And you know that because you've probably bought something by mail that you've had to ship back at one point in time. So you know how this works. Business is no different. So in this case, they returned $300 worth of goods on the 8th. What would it look like on Sock Stereo's book? And this is the buyer. Sock Stereo would simply reverse out the entry by $300. They wouldn't want to pay for it. So they would remove the $300 from accounts payable, which is on the debit side, and they would take it out of their inventory. So removing inventory is on the credit side. That's all they would do for a return. Okay. All right. These credit terms are very common. 210 net to 30 um, is, is a very common credit term. There are more than, I mean, you can make up your own credit terms, but usually you provide an incentive if you pay quicker, which is the 10 day period, we'll give you a discount. If you're gonna take your damn time and pay, then, you know, well, 30 days, the whole thing is different. So uh, basically speaking, uh, the purchaser can save money if they pay early and the seller can collect the cash quickly, which is important, right? Getting that cash, that's what an accounts receivable is to the seller, waiting for the cash. So, um, there are a whole bunch, 210 net 30 is most common. Uh, they have 110 end of month, net 10 end of month. There's a bunch of them, but this is the one you're gonna see most often, almost actually almost all the time in your, in your homework. All right, so let's go. It's been 10 days. We're on May 14th. Sock Stereo, their balance is now $3,500, right? Because they bought $3,800 but they returned $300, so they owe $3,500. But they're paying in that 10-day period. May 14th, they cut the check to send. So what's the journal entry now that they're paying, but they're taking a discount? Well, a discount simply is your inventory costs less. Your inventory costs less. And in the historical cost principle, we simply have to reflect that in the books. And so they paid their entire accounts payable. So a debit to accounts payable shows they no longer have that payable. They paid uh, $3,430 cash because they took the discount. That $70 discount simply means the inventory costs less. And they have to reflect that they paid less for their inventory. So when they're shipping, they have to add it to the inventory to show the inventory costs more. When they take a discount, they simply credit because they're saying they're showing that the inventory costs less. That's how a buyer looks at it. What if they didn't take the discount and they uh, paid on June the 3rd? Well, that's simple because it's just accounts payable and cash that are affected. Okay. Then they would have to pay the entire $3,500 with cash. All right, don't worry about should they take the discount or not. Um, if you continue on in your accounting studies or going to retail, you'll be getting that. So here is the do it exercise for the purchases. And there's two new companies happen on September 5th. We have De La Hoya Company 
buying merchandise on account, which means they got an invoice, from Junorias company. So De La Hoya is the buyer. Juna Diaz is the seller, okay? Learning objective two looks at things from the buyer's perspective. Purchase price is 1,500 bucks. That's on the 5th of September. So on the 5th of September, they're gonna show they bought merchandise inventory on account. $1,500 debit to inventory, $1,500 credit to accounts payable. However, Three days later on the 8th, they return what they say is defective goods for $200. And so they're gonna reverse out $200 of that, okay? Same two accounts, opposite order when you reverse it out. Okay. How do you guys feel about the buyer's end of it? Reasonable? So again, they're looking at it as inventory. And so if they have to pay more for the inventory because they have shipping, then the inventory costs more. We have to put that in the balance sheet as an increase in inventory. But if we save money on a discount, our inventory costs less. And so we show that on the balance sheet with the credit to inventory. It's all about inventory here. Um, the the uh, ownership is important too, so that FOB, there's only two, good news. Um, so you're either there, the ownership passes when the package is given to the shipping company, that's FOB shipping, at which point the buyer is gonna be paying for all that because it's their inventory, it's their problem. Um, the other is FOB destination, which means the seller is picking up all that and the buyer doesn't actually take the inventory until it gets to their destination. And the terms of an invoice is simply trying to get people to pay early by giving them a discount. By giving them a discount, okay? So otherwise it's net 30. It's, a, it's an accounts payable because it's due in 30 days. The worst thing, I mean, I, I did way back in the 80s, I, I was a wholesaler. I, I used to deal with retailers for, uh, for cost, uh, cost, what we call costume jewelry or sort of fake jewelry. It looked nice, but it was, plastic basically um and we used to give them the same terms 210 at 30 and so the bigger companies the bigger retailers would take two percent off and pay us pay me in 30 days um and you know that's one of the things that you kind of have to deal with too it's like you know it's a big customer you piss them off uh, you know because you could lose the business is it really worth it the two percent that they took that they shouldn't have taken so not everybody plays fair as you know all right same invoice but the last thing we're doing is what does the buyer uh we saw what the buyer sees now what does the seller see okay okay here we go All right, so learning objective three looks at the exact same invoice, but now we're the seller. We're the seller. We are PW Audio. And we made a sale on account. And so that means that we didn't collect the cash right away. Uh, we are waiting to collect it. So it's accounts, this invoice becomes a accounts receivable for us. Okay. But again, what we did is we have to do two things. Right, we have to say we sold the goods. And again, that's the whole purpose of our business is we wanna sell our inventory. So selling our inventory is very, very good. And so we have to first show that we actually sold the goods. But then again, we don't have these in stock anymore. They're no longer ours. So we have to make sure we take them out of our inventory. Um, and show them as a cost, as you'll see that. So this it's a little bit different for a seller than a buyer, okay? It's a little bit more complex. Uh, so to record a sale, the, the seller actually has to do two things. They first have to put a journal entry showing the sale, 
if it's on an invoice, it's accounts receivable against the debit, sales revenue gets the credit. This is for the actual selling price to the customer. The second thing they have to do is record the cost because they've sold the inventory and take it out of inventory because they don't own it anymore. So to record the cost of goods sold, which is an expense that's on the debit side, a debit to cost of goods sold is how much that actually cost the company. And then of course we reduce inventory. Inventory is an asset, it gets reduced on the credit side. So this is a very, very important little slide here that you're gonna to need to, to look at because that's how a seller records a sale on their books. Okay. All right, so here's the illustration in your book showing how PW Audio records it. Remember, they sold $3,800 worth of inventory to Sox Stereo. But what you have here is a little extra information because what you don't know is what it actually cost PW Audio. And now they're telling you it actually cost them $2,400, okay? And so again, first thing, we record the sale. <clears throat> In this case, it's on account because we gave them an invoice, debit to accounts receivable, credit to sales revenue. Well, now we actually have to record the cost and take it out of inventory. So the second step we do is debit cost of goods sold for the cost, $2,400 is the cost for us. And that $2,400 of inventory is now gone. And so we take it out of inventory because we sold it. So that's an important aspect to know. All right, we're, we're gonna keep going on. So the flip side of a return is what a seller looks at. So sellers actually have a special account that they call sales returns and allowances. It's a, it is a literal account. It's a revenue account, but it's a contra revenue account. You might remember the only other contra account you had was a contra asset account called accumulated depreciation. So contra revenue is a revenue account with the opposite balance. A contra account is an account with an opposite balance. So revenues are on the credit side. Sales returns and allowances are going to be on the debit side. We don't reduce the sales revenue directly in the sales revenue account. We wanna show exactly what we sold. We keep track of the return separately. I think it's important to understand to us what's coming back, what is being returned and for what reasons. Because we're, we're not in the business of selling stuff that's gonna come back to us as retailers and merchandisers. We just wanna get rid of it. We want it to be sold and the customer to be happy. Why is all this stuff coming back? Uh, that's something that you have to keep track of. So retailers will look at all the returns very carefully and say, gee, should we be selling this product if it keeps coming back to us? The answer, no, unless there's huge profits in it, right? But I doubt it, I doubt it. Um, so we don't reduce the sales revenue account. Instead, we show it being reduced with this account, sales returns and allowances. This is an actual account name. Mm -hmm. So here we go. PW Audio, remember, they had that returned good. Remember that um, Sox Stereo sent them back $300 worth of, uh, it was probably just a circuit that they sent back. Uh, well, that circuit actually had a $140 cost, even though it had a $300 selling price. So how do they handle it? Again, we're assuming that goods were not defective. If something is not defective, you can sell it again to another customer. If it is defective, you're not gonna be selling it to the customer. <laughs> okay. So this is how it works. First thing we do is we're gonna show that sales returns and allowances is going to get the debit because it's a contra revenue account. And of course, if they sent it back, we're not gonna be collecting that money. So our receivables also have to decrease with the credit. The next thing we can do is put it back in our inventory, sell it to somebody else because it's not defective. So inventory is gonna get a debit of $140.
and cost of goods sold needs to be reversed. This is one of the very few expense accounts you'll ever see that literally has a very active credit side. <laughs> because uh, you know, unlike all the other expense accounts which simply fall on the debit side until you close them, uh, cost of goods sold is a little bit different. It's a bit more active on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um, there are times that we live in a, in a, we live in a great time because due to automation and robotics, the defection rate on products when I was a kid was somewhere between three and 5%. So out of every hundred goods that were sold, you know, three to five of them came, were, were sent back because they were defective. Uh, robotics and machinery are are very precise. The defection, the defection rate on, on products today is extremely low. And of course it depends on the product. If it's a simple product, it should not be defective if it's put together by, uh, by automation. If a product is more complex, like automobiles, trucks, things like that, then the risk goes up. More, def more def uh, defects could happen because the, the complexity of the, uh, of the good. Uh, but let's just say we do uh, recognize that the return good was defective. We're not going to be selling it to someone else. We're in most cases going to be sending it back to the manufacturer, unless we're the manufacturer. So we're going to assign something called a scrap value uh, to goods that are returned to us that are defective. Okay, which again happens, I would say less than one time out of every 200 returns, 200 products, 300 products. It happens less than one, one time. Uh, so the first thing we will do is we will actually reverse out the, uh, the sale by showing a sales return for $300 and our receivable will be reduced as well. But instead of selling it uh, again, we will put it back in inventory at a special price. Now this price is 50. I usually would recommend you use an odd price so you, so you know it's defective, 19, 29, something weird. Um, and you would also reduce your cost of goods sold by the same amount here. That only happens on a defective good. But like I said, 90, over 99% of the time, you don't have to worry about this. But it is a textbook and they will show you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the cost of goods sold is determined and recorded at the time of sale for a periodic system only uh, because we're, the computer runs it. We can't do that for smaller things that are on a periodic system. What about a discount? Well, a sales discount is actually a specific account in, uh, for the seller. It's another contra revenue account. Boy, you're learning some new accounts here. Okay. Uh, so sales discounts show up on the debit side, just like accounts, uh, sorry. Um, sales discounts uh, shows on the debit side, just like sales returns and allowances show on the debit side. Um, and this is what we would do. We would look at the, the sales revenue, the actual beginning point for the sales. Of course, that's a, always a credit side balance. Uh, we would subtract out their sales returns and allowances. We would subtract out any discounts. What you'll see on most income statements for retailers is what's called net sales. Net sales is that entire thing taken into consideration. It's the beginning sales revenue minus sales returns and allowances minus sales discounts. You have to know this you have to know net sales. So sales discounts are looked at as a uh, contra revenue account because it takes away from revenue. So again, Sox Stereo paid on the 14th. They took the discount, $70 discount. How would PW Audio Supply record it in their books knowing that Sox Stereo sent them $70 less than what they were expecting. Well, first things first, they would see that they had $3,430 cash. So the cash is gonna be debited. 
the discount of $70 is going to be debited to the sales discounts account. And accounts receivable is now considered paid in full. $35. So here's the wrap up. Same two companies here on the do it exercise, De La Hoya and Juno DS. De La Hoya is the buyer. Juno DS company is the seller. We're looking at it from the seller's perspective. So in this case, how does Juno DS deal with this transaction on their books? All right, well, if you remember back on September the 5th, De La Hoya bought merchandise on account from Juno DS. Uh, selling price was $1,500, but the cost was 800. So the first thing we have to do is show we actually had a sale of $1,500. The second thing is we had to record the cost of goods sold and reduce our inventory. That's what sellers have to do. Then, as you know, on September the 8th, they returned $200 worth of stuff to us. Our cost was 105. Well, we would, to show the return, debit sales returns and allowances by 200 and credit the receivable. And then assuming this isn't effective, which like I said, 99% of the time it's not, we can put it back in our inventory to sell to another customer and we will reverse out our cost of goods sold. Congratulations, you just learned about looking at an invoice from two sites. Again, these are business to business transactions. One business is the buyer and they have to do their books and have their records accurate. The other business is the seller. They have to do their books and keep their uh, records accurate. And that's how they do it. Okay, questions? <laughs> 